All right. Well, welcome. Good to see you. It is six o'clock, so we're going to get started. And uh, it's been a week or, or more. Let's see. It's just one week since we were in 119, since we were in Psalm 119. We had the, the dinner last Sunday night. And then prior to that, we were in our, let's see, we were in our third week. So this is our fourth installment of Psalm 119. So you can go ahead and turn in your Bible, Psalm 119. And we'll be in verses 25 to 32 tonight. And uh, I know, I don't know if you may feel this way or not. I know sometimes when I'm reading this, it's such a long chapter. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. But, uh, and it is systematic in the way it's separated in the eight verse sections. But sometimes, I suppose, if you're reading it, just reading it through, you could get to the point where, you know, the, the theme of the whole chapter is all about the Word of God. And I guess you, there's the potential that you could uh, start to feel like it's being repetitive or, you know, well, I've already read something like that already, you know. And, but I want, you, I want to reassure you that even though it's all about the same subject, each section is unique in, in itself, you know. So it's not, uh, it's not like we can, well, we could just read part of it and skip over, the, you know, this part. It's all important. It's all important. And that goes for all of God's Word, quite frankly. Uh, all of God's Word is important. Even, even Leviticus, you know, even some of the parts when you, in numbers, when you start reading all the, the tribes and all the people and all the numbers and all, and it's just like, how in the world is this, is this important to the grand scheme of things? Well, I will tell you this. God wouldn't have put it in there if it wasn't important. We we can rest assured of that, and and one day, uh, not this year, but one day, we're gonna tackle some of these Old Testament parts of Scripture where where uh, we can start to really see uh, how all of it ties together. Because I will tell you this before we get into this section. Sometimes I suppose it's tempting to think, well, I'm I'm more. I'm more of a New Testament person. You know, we're at the New Testament church. I want to just, I want to study the New Testament. Well, here's a secret that you may or may not know. Until you really, really understand the Old Testament and the, the systematic order and progression of the Old Testament and the people in the Old Testament that God used for different things and the promises and covenants he made and the way it goes, why it goes the way it goes. Until you understand the Old Testament, you will never grasp the importance of the New Testament. It seems like the New Testament being, starting with Jesus, that's where we want to go naturally, you know. But the Old Testament gives you such a greater understanding of the parts that we already love, you know, the New Testament. So just throw that out there. Uh, don't be afraid to read in, in the Old Testament. It's, it's good. It's healthy for you. So here we are in Psalm 119, verses 25 to 32. This is the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Dalet is the, the letter for this week. And um, here's what's going on, just kind of as an overview. In this section, the psalmist is calling out, almost crying out for revival, for strength, which is interesting as we get into it. I'll, I'll tell you why that's almost ironic. But here's what happens when revival happens. If the psalmist is crying out for that, for strength, and for revival. Revival comes when we reach the end of our own resources and we repent and we call out for God to intervene, right? That's uh, from Johnny Hunt, from his commentary on this, on this psalm, which, by the way, I'll just remind you, I am heavily leaning on his wisdom from his study and preaching of this psalm. Uh, but here's the real question. As I read that sentence that he wrote, and I read this psalm, and I read this section, if he's calling out for revival and strength, here's the real question to me. 
Why does it seem to take us so long to get to that point? Because uh, Dr. Hunt's contention is that we reach the end. Here's what he says. We reach the end of our own resources, and so then we repent and call out to God. Why does that take so long? Why does it take us so much time to call out to God? Why are we so... Um, seems like we're bent on trying to be self-sufficient. You know, it's like, well, no, I can do it. I don't need, I don't need any help. Even, even in our practical everyday lives, if we're working on a project or something, we're doing something around the house and somebody comes by, hey, you need some help with that? No, 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 I can get it. I can get it. I'm fine. I got it. Right? That, that's our natural, almost our, our can answer. That's what we're going to say every time. No, I got it. Unless we, Unless it's just... So difficult, so challenging. Well, yeah, I guess I could use a little help. But why are we so... It seems, and I'm making a generalization, I understand that. But it seems like we're so um, averse to accepting help from people or, or even from God. Why is that? It's like we, we continually try to do things in our own strength before we realize that our efforts are really in vain, especially when it comes to spiritual things. We, we just try and try and try, knowing full well, if we've read the Bible much at all, we know that that's, that's not the way it works. We know we need God at every turn. You know, we, we need Him for everything. And so God's reviving strength is available to us long before we reach the end of ourselves. You know, we don't have to get to that point. We don't have to take it to that extent. Uh, unfortunately, many times it seems we are just, uh, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself and just including all y'all so I don't feel as bad, uh, but m maybe we're just too stubborn to seek God's intervention before we're actually in a mess, you know? Have you ever heard? Uh, well, I, I can handle this, but you know, if I get in, if I get in some tough times, and I'll, I'll pray, I'll call out to God. If I if I get in a, you know, in, in a fix, then I'll I'll seek God. Why? Why don't we continue to seek Him when things are going wonderful, when He's blessing us, when when we're on a mountaintop? Why would we not continue to to try to stay in in His presence? But unfortunately, many times that is not the way it works. It is. It's very prideful, and it is very foolish. And uh, Johnny Hunt continues on. He says, the enemy attacks us the hardest when we are enjoying the blessings of God. So we ought to expect that. It's best to call on God consistently rather than waiting to call 911 when there's an emergency. Right, and a lot of people, uh, I use that phrase sometimes. Uh, well, he's just your nine one one God. You don't you don't really care about spending time with him till you get in a mess. Then all of a sudden you're praying, and you know, God, please help me. If you'll do this, I promise I'll do whatever. You know, make a bargain, and you know, that's not how it works. Uh, God wants to be in communion with us all the time. So let me read this this eight verse section here. Uh, Psalm 119, starting at verse 25, and then we'll talk about a couple of things here that we see. Here's what the Bible says. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I've told of my ways, and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. I have chosen the faithful way. I have placed your ordinances before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I shall run the way of your commandments. For you will enlarge my heart. Now, in today's or this week's section, 
there's a couple of things here that you can see the psalmist is doing that I think is, uh, as I read, the way I understood uh, what what the psalmist is doing and has done, it's, it's uh, helpful for us to see things we maybe should be doing as well. So the first thing that you see here is confess the truth. Confess the truth. You see the... The first part of this says, my soul cleaves to the dust. Now, back up one verse and look at verse 24. The last verse of the previous section, remember, this is, this is, it is separated in sections, but it, it goes together. So if you look at verse 24, what was he doing in 24? He was delighting in the testimonies of God because they are his counselors. You know, he's, he's delighting. And then the, the very next sentence, his face is in the dirt. <laughs> My soul cleaves to the dust. You know, it's like things went from wonderful to terrible almost in, in an instant. And so uh, as this section begins, it's almost like there's been a spiritual attack of sorts. And so you go from delighting in God's testimonies because of the wise counsel and then now all of a sudden, there's as a result of some spiritual attack, he's now face down in the dirt, so to speak. So that prompts this prayer, this cry for revival. But look what, look what the uh, criteria is. He says, revive me according to your word. So it's not just a general plea. It's specific. It's, God, I, I believe... Your word is going to be instrumental in this in my turnaround. If if I get in your word, if I hear from you, then maybe my soul will not be cleaved to the dust anymore. Revive me according to your word. And what's his next step when you get to verse 26? Confess. Remember? Confess the truth. I have told of my ways. So now we're looking at some self-reflection. We're looking at some self-examination. And so perhaps there's this introspection is because, hey, I was delighting in the Lord's Word a minute ago, and now all of a sudden my soul cleaves to the dust. What could I have done to cause that? What, maybe, you know, this is interesting. I'm, I'm glad I just thought of this. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, sometimes we, get, we can get so hung up in being upset about our circumstances, that we could skip over the idea of pausing and thinking, hmm, did I do anything stupid to bring this on myself? Did I do something sinful? Did I cause this? Sometimes we could do, you know, stupid things, and we are responsible for our circumstances sometimes, right? Anybody anybody testify about that? Yeah, I I mean, I've done... done, I mean, let's be honest, right? Confession's good for the soul. And so there's plenty of times where I can look back and say, boy, that was, that was so stupid. Why did I do that? I know better than that, right? And so I'm sitting in circumstances that are terrible, and they were all my fault. It wasn't because God's judging me or the devil's testing me. I was just doing stupid stuff, you know, that was avoidable. Completely avoidable. So it's almost as if now the psalmist is confessing his sins. He tells of his ways to the Lord. And look at the response. The Lord answers his confession. I've told of my ways, and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. So you can almost get a sense that there is something that maybe that was a a contribution that (laughs) that the writer made to his his, uh, terrible uh, dilemma here. So he tells his ways to the Lord, and the Lord answers, and the psalmist prays for God to teach him, teach me his statutes. Have you ever prayed something like that? Have you ever been reading the Bible, and something just hits you a certain way, and and you hear something, you may say something like this to yourself, oh boy, I really need to learn that lesson. I, I I need to do better at that. Lord, just help, help help me with that. You know I struggle. You know, I've, I've, I have some of the best conversations I have are with myself just uh, sitting in the office alone or riding down the road in the truck, and I'll, I'll just talk out loud to myself. You know, God will put something on my heart, and, and I'll just realize, I wonder if anybody's watching me because I'm sitting here just, just a-talking, and, 
you know, the phone's not up to my ear. And, the, of course, I guess nowadays you got hands-free, so I guess you could be conceivably talking on the phone and not looking like a, a crazy person. But, you know, I talk to myself because sometimes it helps me think through it better when I say it out loud, you know. I have more clarity that way. But I've read, and something has been impressed upon me, and I think, Lord, help me with that. I really need, I, I need to do better at that. And so the psalmist prays, Lord, teach me your statutes. Teach me your word. Teach me to follow your word. Now, the next prayer here in verse 27 is for understanding. I love the way this is phrased in tw verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts. Make me understand. So you know what this says to me? There's an acknowledgment that... God is doing a work in us when we read his word. It's not just passive. We're not just reading and we're just alone. You, you know what the Bible says? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of God is living and active, living and powerful, right? Sharper than any two-edged sword. And it divides the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and in intentions of a man's heart. That means that when we read the Bible, we're, this is not just a, you know, a nothing activity. God is actively at work. He's, he's working on us if, if we'll pay attention, if we'll cooperate, if we'll receive what he's trying to do. So, the psalmist says, make me understand, not just understand the precepts, but understand, look at that, the way of your precepts. So God has power through the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and give us understanding. In fact, the Bible says in Corinthians that, that the natural man can't understand the Word of God because it's spiritually discerned. How about that? Did you know? that the unbeliever, until they cry out to God for forgiveness and repent of their sins, they can't understand the Word of God. That's why 1 Corinthians 1.18 says the Word of God, the Word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They, they don't get it. I, I'll tell you the story again, just the, the headline. When I was uh, between high school and college, one of my good friends from high school, we had a conversation about spiritual things, and he asked me about... Uh, what's the Bible say about how the world was created and everything? We're talking about creation, and they're talking about all these scientific things. And I told him the story of Genesis 1 and 2, and he said, Oh, this sounds like a fairy tale. I said, Well, you know, looking back on it, well, I guess it would. You don't believe in, in Christ, and you're not a Christian, so I guess it, do, it does sound foolish to you. I don't know why I was so surprised. I wasn't thinking as clearly as I am now. But that is a... A, a gift, make me understand. The Holy Spirit will give us enlightenment. And we need to know more than just God's precepts alone. We need to know the way of his precepts. That gives us a deeper understanding. It tells us not just what to know, but where to go. Right? H how does God work? How is he working his word into us and through us so we can do what he calls us to do? And look at the, the last part of verse 27. The purpose of our understanding is so we can meditate. We can ponder the wonder of God's word and his ways. I love how he says that. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. You ever do that? You ever just think about stuff? Just think about God. Think about what he's done. Think about how amazing creation is. Or think about miracles he may have done in your life or your family or, you know, your kids. Or You think about what God has done. It ought to cause us to just take a minute and, and just consider, wow, God is, is almighty. He, he does the miraculous. He, he does, he makes a way when there is no way. He does things that we can't explain. He, he can, how many times has someone uh, been diagnosed with, a, with an illness and they go back to the doctor? Well, I don't know, we can't find, I don't know, I don't know where it went, but we, it was plain as day right there and then now it's, there's nothing there. I don't know what to tell you. What's the answer to that question? God did something. 
right? Let's just be honest. All these coincidences and it's just ways for the world to try to keep God anonymous. It's not a coincidence. It's not an accident. It's, it's God. God does wonders and miracles. And so the more we understand, make me understand your precepts so I can meditate on your wonders. You know, when we start talking about praying for revival, which is what is, is happening here at the beginning, um, Dr. Hunt, in his commentary, he gives three suggestions for action to take when the church or the individual Christian is in need of revival. And I, I really like these. First of all, pray more aggressively. Second, witness more intentionally. And third, lead by emulation or exhortation. In other words, follow the example of Christ and then exhort or encourage others to follow the example of Christ. And, and it, can you imagine if we're, if we're crying out for revival, personally or collectively, if we sense that that's our need, we need to see revival, we need to be re-energized or reconnected to a greater extent with the Lord, what could be better than praying more and talking more about Jesus and following Jesus closer? I mean, that's some pretty good advice, isn't it? And those types of things will lead us in the direction of being revived. So the first thing here that we've seen in the text, confess the truth. Confess to God. Talk to God. Tell him the truth, and he will answer. Number two, cry out for strength. Cry out for strength. Verse 28. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me. And again, you see a similarity? You see a pattern? Verse 25 said, revive me according to your word. Verse 28 says, strengthen me according to your word. That's not a coincidence. So this section consists of one statement, three prayers, and two responses. So that first statement, my soul weeps because of grief. That's my condition. So what is my prayer? Strengthen me according to your word. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 9, you might recall Paul is wrestling with this thorn in the flesh. And the Bible says he pleaded with the Lord three times, take it away. Just take it away. Take it away. And you remember what, what the Lord said to him? My grace is sufficient. And why is that? He says, my power is perfected in your weakness. Until we get to the point that we understand and realize, I can't do this. I need help. Until we get to that point, we will never realize the full power and the extent of the power of God in our lives. Because as long as we're still trying to do it, then we can't get out of his way so he can do it, right? And, and, that, and we, some, can you imagine being a Christian, living the Christian life, and never completely letting go to the point where we can fully realize the power of God that's available to us? That would be a shame. My grace is sufficient for you for power. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And then so you know what Paul says to that? Then most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses. So the power of Christ will dwell in me. I'm thankful to, to be weak because I want all, all that, the power that Jesus can give me. I don't want him to, I don't want him to uh, you know, cinch up the hose. I want him to be full blast. I want everything. First prayer, strengthen me according to your word. The second prayer, he says, remove the false way from me. Maybe I should have done this uh, Wednesday night. He's talking about getting rid of lying. I'm, I'm harping on that again. I'm sorry. Uh, it says, you know, remove the false way from me. Stop lying. But look at what, look what he says. 
He doesn't say remove me from it. He says remove it from me. So we're talking about some sanctification here. This doesn't have any place in my life, Lord, so just get it away from me. Just get it away from me. I, I don't need to have any falsehood, any false way in me. Remove it from me. The third prayer, graciously grant me your law. So it always goes back to the Word of God. It always goes back to the Word of God. So because his soul is weeping because of grief, his three prayers are for strength according to the Word, the removal of the false way from him, and then a, a gracious granting of the law, the word again. So it begins and ends with the word. Now look at the, the responses based on the prayers, and, and here's how the, the perspective changes in the writer. I have chosen the faithful way, and I have placed your ordinances before me. So I'm following the word. And I'm, and I'm, you ever, uh, you ever seen those, you ever seen Greyhound races, dogs running? You see what's on the inside of the track? It's a rabbit, right? And, and what is that? What's the purpose of the rabbit? Because it's going. What's it doing? Yeah, and, and it's, it's right out in front of them. And, but what is it? What's its, what's its uh, purpose? It's a focal point. So they don't get distracted. They don't start looking around and waving to, you know, I know it's dogs, but, you know, wave to their mama in the stands, you know. You know none of that. It's like, no, I see the rabbit. I'm going to get the rabbit. I'm going to run as fast as I can. I'm, I'm running hard after that. I have placed your ordinances before me. Can you imagine? We're the dogs. The rabbit is God's word, and we're running as hard and fast as we can to get it. That's, that's our focus. You know why in horse races they put these little things on the horse's eyes? They don't want them distracted. You look straight ahead. You look at your, your, your end point, your, your goal. That's what you're shooting for. You're going straight towards that. You don't want anything to get in the way, right? So the psalmist says God's word is our focus. That's what we're running hard and fast after. So notice that in the prayers, in the responses, in every prayer, there's God's part, there's our part. Well, the good thing is, God always does his part, right? He, he never fails to do his part, but sometimes we don't always do our part. So when you see these responses, you see that he prayed, but then he acted, okay? See... We have to do our part and work in cooperation with the Lord. Because what good would it do? I got a problem. So I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to sit down. All right, Lord. I prayed. Go ahead. Do your thing. I might just lie back, take a nap. I'll just wait. You know, you, you can handle it. I'll just wait for you. That doesn't sound right, does it? You know why it doesn't sound right? Because it's not right. Because God doesn't expect us to just sit around and wait for him to do his thing, and we have no responsibility whatsoever. That's not how it works. I wish I could trace. I, I'm sure I could look this up. I should have, but it just came to me, so I'm going to share it anyway. Someone else said, not me. You work like it all depends on you, but you pray like it all depends on God. Right? We know. We know God is sovereign. We know he's almighty. We know we can't do stuff without him. We know that. But it doesn't mean we just sit around. It means we work. We do our part. Right? We do what he calls us to do. And we know that he's working right along. And, and he's... He's ahead of us. <laughs> he's ahead of us and behind us. He's all around us. And we know that he's working. So we need to work too. So confess the truth. Cry out for strength. Number three, consecrate your heart. Consecrate your heart. Verse 31 and 32, it's almost um, a desperation. 
and urgency. I will, I, I'm clinging to your testimonies, O oh Lord. This is what Johnny Hunt calls apprehension. You know what it means to apprehend a fugitive? You catch him. You get him. You got him. You're not going to let him go, right? So we are going to apprehend God's word. I cling to your testimonies, O oh Lord. Do not put me to shame. So I'm, I've grabbed hold of the word, and I'm never going to let it go. Because God's word is a treasure that we need to hold on tight to it. And the psalmist prays for the Lord to keep him from shame because he is clinging. He's clinging to the word. He's, he's holding it tightly. And so because of that, because I'm holding on to the word, I'm praying that I would be kept from shame. And then in verse 32, you move from apprehension to comprehension. I need to understand. And so the psalmist says in verse 32, I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. Run the way of your commandments. You remember what he prayed in verse 27? Make me understand the way of your precepts. So God's already answered the prayer. Lord, make me understand the way of your precepts, and now I'm going to run the way of your commandments. So now, how can you run after something if you don't understand it? Look at this progression. We have to read the Word before we can understand the Word, and we have to understand the Word before we can obey the Word. If somebody just tells you to do something and you don't, know, you don't get it, how are you going to do what you're told to do if you don't understand it? Right? So we have to read it, pray the Spirit, make me understand, and once we understand, I'm going to run the way. Make me understand the way, now I'm going to run the way. And here's what happens at the end of verse 32. As we read and understand and obey the Word of God, He will enlarge our hearts to do His will. We will have more of a heart desire for God and his word and his ways so that we will run the way of your commandments. So here's how this looks. As we acknowledge our weakness, just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, as we acknowledge our weakness, we can realize God's strength. So let me close with a... One more quote from my, my friend Johnny Hunt. He says, this is the way of revival. Out of our brokenness, out of our weakness, we cry out to God, and he answers according to his word. He comes and revives us. He comes and strengthens us. He places us in the path of truth. In our weakness, we find his strength, and this should give us hope. God will come and give us life once again if we ask him. Let's pray.